Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we will dive into a very exciting topic, buyer decision making, what you don't know is costing you winnable deals. Let's meet today's speakers. Michael Rochelle. Michael is the Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder at Brandon Hall Group. Michael serves in a variety of roles, including overseeing research and advisory support for organizations and solution providers. Michael is one of the company's principal analysts covering all areas of human capital management. Michael has 40 years of experience in our space. Roberta Gogos. Roberta is Brennan Hall Group's VP of Agency and Principal Analyst. She has 15 years in the HR and learning tech space. She has been on the consultancy side, agency side, and has held CMO roles on the vendor side. She specializes in brand, position, and developing marketing strategies that build market share and profitability. For those of you who aren't familiar with Brandon Hall Group, we're a human capital management research and advisory firm that empowers excellence in organizations around the world through our research and tools. We have six practice areas, including learning and development, talent management, and leadership development. A quick mention that we currently have several certification programs open for enrollment, including our Certified Learning Strategist Program. Visit certification.brandonhall.com to learn more about how to earn the designation. Your participation in Brennan Hall Group's research surveys is one of the most crucial components of our insights and thought leadership. So if you have a few minutes to spare and see any topics that you can take to a survey for, it's greatly appreciated. As you can see, we have three open surveys right now. Mastering the talent equation, igniting the leadership spark, and the learning revolution. Links will be available in your handout or you can always visit them at brennanhall.com. All participants receive a piece of complimentary research once the results are analyzed. Now, a few logistics. To ask questions, please use the question panel on your control bar. We will leave time at the end for questions. The webinar is being recorded. We will share a link to the recording and a PDF of the presentation via email in roughly 24 hours. The chat is also open for today, and we really hope you will share your thoughts and experiences as we go along in the webinar today. Your feedback and perspective, perspective on, the, on what we present today and on your own experiences will make the webinar more valuable for everyone. So please join in on today's discussion and share your thoughts as we go through, or just simply pop in, say hello, and let us know where you're joining from today. Okay. Let's get to the content. Roberta will get us started. Thanks a lot, Ivy. So let's kick off then with how we see the market. Um, this is, and what most buyers complain about falls into, into these categories. This is what we're going to be covering in today's session with, with Michael. Um, oops. I've lost the slide. Thank you. <laughs> so... Basically, the four categories that we see um, that are most that we can bucket by our complaints into fall into either uh, the di differentiator that everybody looks and sounds the same product. There's a lot of sizzle, but where's the steak? Partner value and use cases, and we'll be diving into these as we go along. Um, I have I will be sharing a few stats as we go as well, and um, the first one that I wanted to share is that. Our research shows that 89% of buyers rate their current learning technology below five on a 10 point scale. So there's a lot that we need to address to get that, you know, somewhere that will not be impacting the biz businesses negatively on, on your side. So um, differentiators, it's, we need to think about, do you understand your core competencies? What is your true competitive alternative? Can you articulate what your secret source is? On the product side, do you have a complete solution? Does your product match what your ICP is looking for? On the partnering side, are you a good partner? 
how closely do you work with customers to understand specific needs and challenges? Do you actively help your customers demonstrate the value and impact of their investment? How well do your clients rate you in onboarding, training, and ongoing support? We'll be covering all of this in today's session. Michael, do you have anything to add here? Shall we? Yeah, let's get into continue? it. So let's get into first it. of all, oh, let's go. Let's go. There we go. So thanks to everyone that's joining. Really want you to be able to participate, ask your questions. We'll be asking questions of you as we go through this. It's super important that we try to bring a perspective to people like yourselves that are on the provider side as to what you're up against with buyers. You only see part of the sales cycle. So what we want to do today is kind of pull back the curtain and have you see what we see. We've been in the space for over three decades. We've done over 10,000 engagements worldwide, the vast majority of those involving technology and service provider selections. So we're trying to bring to you what we see. We're able to get into the back room, be there with buyers, talk to them, and this is what they're feeding back to us. So it would be great for everyone that's listening today to kind of give us your feedback at the same time as we go through each of these points to say, are you experiencing this? Are you experiencing it the same way we're describing it? Do you have different experiences? But most importantly, we're here to answer any questions you may have too. So I'd love to make sure that we have that dialogue going. So as Roberta brought up, everybody looks and sounds the same. I know that everybody on this call would argue to the death that they're different than everybody else. I mean, it's, it's part of our DNA that we need to do that. But buyers are finding that providers are looking, the same. there's thousands of providers. And candidly, you have to look a lot the same, otherwise you wouldn't be in business. I mean, there are table stakes out there to attract buyers. If buyers are having a problem with this, that last five or 10% that's gonna tip the scales towards you. You know, what are those differentiators? As Roberta pointed out, what is that secret sauce? What is that thing that you do better than anyone else in terms of solving their problem? What we call a unique fit, buyer's perspective. And that's what we're getting at by the, the first. And, and you really need to bear down on that because one thing I will throw out to you right away is your number one competitor is the do nothing scenario. And that's the point that you should take away from this slide is buyers are saying, you're not providing enough momentum to overcome my inertia of doing nothing. You know, the proverbial phrase of, you know, I don't want to jump from the frying pan into the fire. I could get fired making a change with a provider. So you've really got to give me a compelling argument to put the organization through all this change, quite frankly, stick my neck out to work with you. Like there's a lot riding here. It's a very personally mm -hmm. committed decision-making. And so when everyone sounds kind of the same and you're not leading with your differentiators, your use cases, what you've done for your clients the before and after all of that, it just makes it difficult for them to make any decision. And when we talk about a lot of sizzle, but where's the stake? We have a tendency and listen and provide. We do probably upwards of four dozen briefings a week with providers. Is we we see this from an analyst firm as well as we're always being sold. You know, that's the sizzle. Like, this is what we do, this is what we do, this is what we do. But people aren't making decisions on based on demos. They're making decisions based on there's a lot of things that you can throw at me, but are you asking enough questions? to understand of all the things that you do, can you narrow it down to the things that I need of you? And so they want to get past the sizzle. You know, they want to get past the show and tell and the selling and the pushing and, you know, drop down menus and color palettes and all these different functionality pieces. They want to know this is what we're facing every day. And can you uniquely solve this for us? The other feedback we get is I need a partner and not a problem solver. We have to move away from the idea that we're solution providers. You know, the problem definition has kind of been beat to death. The idea is, is that there's all, you may be addressing the problem that they're thinking about today, July 25th, 2024, you know, at 2.15 Eastern Standard Time. But you have to push beyond that. What you have to get 
to do is you got to get buyers to be revealing about what's on the horizon for them. What are they going to be going through from a future proofing standpoint? Are they on an acquisition craze? Are they going ups and downs in their employee count? Like what are they living through? Because our research shows that above every piece of functionality or service that you can offer as a provider, the number one thing buyers are looking for is a partner. They literally tell us, we don't need a solution provider. We need a partner, someone who's going to ride the ups and downs with us. Someone's going to be there always. We're not going to be 150th in their queue for client services. They're going to do things for us. They're always going to keep us on our toes. Their product roadmap or service roadmap is always going to stretch us. You know, we're never going to be able to outgrow this provider. I want to feel like this provider is shoulder to shoulder with me. Then when I go into the big meetings, you're there for me. And you're going to make sure that I don't fail. And this is exceptionally important. And then the last one that they give us feedback on is it's tell, tell, tell. Nobody listens. We've got to get our sales teams to get into the idea that it should be an active listening session. I can't tell you how many buyers say, look, it, it makes it sound like no matter what was going to come out of my mouth, I was going to get the same answer anyway. And we have to make sure that we don't do that. We have to make sure that we really understand the needs of the buyer early in the process and draw them into the conversation. As you all know on this call, like getting people to talk about themselves is the best sales strategy you can have. And we just have buyers saying like, they don't really feel like that's part of the process. You know, it's immediately into, this is what we can do for you. This is how we do it. We're better at it than anybody else. And there's not a lot of active listening there. So we really have to hone in on that. Robert, I don't know if you want to add anything to this, but this is kind of, we wanted to use this slide as a kickoff as kind of a being real with you in this discussion so that you do learn something that's different or maybe you don't hear or might even be a little bit defensive about in terms of your process. But we wanted to share with you what we hear. So, Roberta, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are on this as well. Yeah, I think we can um, we can move to the next story. Like the everybody looks and sounds the same um, on the uniquely differentiated point. We can d dive into that a little bit later. Um, but uh, at, from the marketing perspective, I was like I have pretty strong opinions on that, and particularly um, in the briefing processes, as Michael said, we we're seeing you know, thirty to forty um, solution providers on a, on a weekly basis. And when we're seeing in briefings, um, um, people come to us with their, with, their, with their stories and it's, you know, it's great. It's like we, we, we want to be able to look at these um, at all the pro providers we see because our, you know, our um, corporate clients come to us with, with questions when they're doing their evaluations. And to be honest, it's, it's really hard to get differentiated, to get an understanding of differentiated products beyond, um, it's hard for solution providers to go beyond features when they're talking about their differentiation. So I just wanted to add that, you know, product, um, if it's really innovative, it could be that, but it's, it's often, you know, your, your feature set is not how you're uniquely differentiated. It's not your secret source usually. So, how do we get better? Well, let's take a I pause on that, Roberta. Let's ask you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. From an audience perspective, are you tracking with us? Give us your feedback in the chat. Is it making sense to you? Are you getting some of this feedback? Is this net new feedback for you? Well, how are you feeling about this as we get ready for how do we do better? So how do we do better? We collectively have to be able to prove that we are the right partner. I mean, being the right partner is the key to all of this. And oh, it's uh, so we just got some feedback, Ivy, from Lisa that Chad is disabled on my end, but it's but these things are landing for her. So that's great, Lisa. So are we okay, Ivy, on chat? Just want to make sure that chat's working okay. Um. Yep. Okay. And Kyle's asking, are these themes across LMS offering LCMS similar challenges with all L&D tools? 
You know, that's a great mm -hmm. question. Roberta and I thought long and hard about should we put all different types of providers onto, onto these kind of buyer calls. We wanted to focus specifically with learning providers because candidly, whether you're selling an LXP, an authoring tool, an LMS, these are broad ranging problems for buyers because these are things that are at the core of understanding what your unique solution is. It isn't like LMS providers are doing worse than LXP providers or authoring tool providers are doing better than others. This is what we get from our learning buyers. This is what they're they're saying. And candidly, you know, in the marketplace, overall, from what we see, you know, there aren't, it, it can't really create a positive environment. Like every time we track on learning providers, overall, the industry is getting a negative MPS. And we also know that the churn rate, so that you know that we're not just kind of making this up as we go along, we track a churn rate that's statistically between 30 and 40% annual churn rate on learning providers. Is that the, is that the fault of the 1200 LMS providers out there or the three dozen authoring tool providers that are out there or the list goes on? No, what it is is that we're dealing with a flawed process on the corporate side, on the organizational side. They've not done this before, most oftentimes or done it very little. They don't have enough time. They don't know what the right things to ask. They're squeezed and trying to get this done right away. There's a lot of pressure that leads to a flawed process. So what we're trying to point out here is you just got to kind of look as a collectively as a learning provider group and say, we're not getting high marks because the churn rate, the only thing that should make you feel better <laughs> is the churn rate is, is higher with other forms of HR providers. But we don't want to have we don't want to be tracking a 30 or 40 percent churn rate with learning providers. And this is what we're trying to get out with the get better is these are the things that we're facing. And so you got to be a, a better partner. And you may think that you're a great partner, but when you think about your sales decks, when you think about your collaterals, when you think about your materials, when you're addressing the buyer, whether it's top of the funnel, mid to bottom of the funnel, where can they point to? your bill of rights or your proof points as being a partner? Where, did, where does that stand in your messaging and positioning? And partner means you have to be transparent, revealing about you as a company, you know, cultural fit. You know, do people at your organization match up well with the people at, at your clients' organizations, your buyers' organizations? Do they come from the same background? So they have the same like thinking. What are you doing to be transparent and revealing about who you are as an organization. You know, one of the best things that we tell providers in terms of being a better partner is share what you do as a company with your buyers. Like, what is your culture like? What do you do? Are you a good corporate citizen? Are you like have charitable foundations that you invest in? You know, what do you do for your employees? Do How does your culture match the culture of your buyers? And then being sharp on your use cases, Robert and I do a lot of a lot of briefings along with the rest of the analyst team here. And I can tell you that I will stop a provider dead in their tracks on a briefing if I don't hear use cases coming within the first few minutes. Because use cases to me are the utility of your product, like getting my attention drawn as a buyer to do is anything that you've ever worked on before from a use case and you're, what's coming as a differentiator and why you're better at it than anybody else. They know it's coming downstream. But at a basic level, are these the use cases that are important to me as a buyer? You need to get those out front and you need to have your buyers react to that. If they don't know that you're specializing in certain problem solving or certain approaches, then you could end up being disconnected right away. And that's what buyers, are always concerned about with these demos and these long-winded discussions and positions of things, is you're not saying we're really good at the following things. We do these things very well all the time, and we're going to get to how we do it. How do these particular situations resonate with you? I mean, if you ask your sales team, do they really know what the ultimate use cases are of their buyers within the first five minutes of a sales call? 
or are they getting that understanding within the first two clicks of your website or within the first paragraph of a collateral? That's a rhetorical question to the audience is to go back and say, objectively, are we? And if you're not, then you're not connecting with the buyer. The other thing is, is how you're uniquely differentiated. What that means is, and just to kind of bring it back to a buyer perspective, when buyers say uniquely differentiated, what they're saying is, is this your core competency? Can you prove that this, you're better at it than anybody else? Because this is where you eat, sleep, and drink every day. Like you wake up and you can't wait to come to work to solve these particular things. So we oftentimes have real deep discussions because Roberta oversees our marketing agency as well as being an analyst. We argue all the time with providers that they want to cast a wide net. You know, they don't want wow. anyone to be left out at the top of the funnel. They don't want to yeah. have anybody, you know, boy, if we say that, then other people might not think that we do that. And it's actually counterintuitive to how buyers buy right now. They're looking to eliminate you in the process, to be honest. There's so many providers to look at. They want to get to your website, your materials, your discussions. And definitively say, you know what, I didn't hear what I needed within the third, first 30 seconds so that they can move on because there's so many other providers to go talk to. So they're trying to eliminate you. They don't have the time to include all of you. So what you've got to do right up front is you got to capture their attention. you got to show like, this is what we do all the time. And if we do this for you, you're going to have 100% of our attention. And then finally, mm -hmm. the complete product. What we mean by that is not being what we would call a sweet provider. We don't mean that. We don't mean like you have to be like a walking, talking Swiss Army knife learning provider. What we're saying is, can you show that whether you're a niche provider offering one thing or a platform provider offering 10 things or a service provider offering one thing or a service provider offering nine things, what is the 360 degree view that you're portraying to that buyer? Is the pricing, the service, the product itself, the engagement level, are you sounding like you've thought about all of it? Many buyers come to us and say, you know, they talk about being a complete solution, but really they're not. Like they offer stuff. But as far as what I feel comfortable making a decision around them and doing that 360 look, at that offering, it feels incomplete. And that's the reason why I bow out. So you may be saying, you know, how do I lose the deal? You may, you may literally on paper have the better product and you won't get chosen because completeness to the buyer is a different thought process. It's comfortability. You should look at the word complete being synonymous with comfort. Am I comforted by the fact that you have thought of everything? No stone has gone unturned as they say. That's what we're after. So, Roberta, like, I, you know, I've been kind of talking about the things that we go through with on the analyst side, the engagement side, the consulting side. You see it on the agency side as well when you're looking at people's marketing. I do. I, I did want to add to the because you were talking about casting a wide net and being everything to everyone. And commonly the what you see in terms of uh, in terms of sales and marketing is that you've then got a really broad target market you've got okay we're going for a bit of small or we're in, in medium and large and we're doing extended enterprise or there's there's a um the solution providers are need to buckle down on not just their their use cases but their target market and they're and they're really related right so like when you've got, um, to Michael's point earlier, are your use cases reflective of what you're good at, what your buyers want and need? Like what are the use cases that are best suited to your product and to your target market? And your target market, you need to choose so that your sales that in your marketing can be really honed in in, in terms of your messaging because your buyer uh, uh, for the mid-level or for large uh, what they're looking for is quite different their problems are quite different right so that's that's something that you see very commonly um, across different learning solution providers so let's keep going 
So now we're going to do a little bit of speed rounds on four areas that we think are important as takeaways. So we're going to kind of pick up the pace. Think about these four areas ahead of time. We're going to be focusing on partner. We're going to be focusing on use case, differentiator, and product. So this is the kickoff on right partner. And you'll notice that we're not hitting you with stats and soliloquies and cliches and all of these different things. These are actual quotes. I want you to know direct quotes from buyers. And when we interview buyers, this is exactly what they say to us. They're not describing the right partner with metrics. They're saying, I need someone to stand shoulder to shoulder to me. I want to feel like they've got me. And they say things like being willing to stand tall in the windy gap. What do they mean by that? When things get rough within my organization, like if the rollout isn't going right or post-implementation isn't going right, or I'm getting feedback that this isn't going well, you know, I need a provider to step up and, and help me. So I'm not standing there all by myself in the windy gap. I want to know that my provider is going to do whatever I can to turn around the impression that's going on. And, and let's face it, as providers, nobody is good all the time. What, like that old expression, it's not how you fall down, it's how you get up. That's what they're looking for. The other is, is be clear you're not going anywhere. I can't tell you, or I, I will tell you, that you know that there have been a lot of high profile acquisitions, mergers, you know, some notable organizations that are no longer around. Your buyer is not just a learning professional, as you know. You've got a CFO back there somewhere that's going to be, you know what? They sound really cool, but what's their financial viability? Are they, are they bait for another acquisition? Are they VC based where they're trying to get out before they get in? Like these are the tough questions that take place behind the scenes. So you want to lead with the fact that you're a stable organization. You're not going anywhere. Doesn't mean that you're like funded to the level of having a nine figure bank account, but you want to get the point across that this is a passion to you. You have no plans on just building up the business to get out of it or, or at, you know, entertaining buyers, you're financially viable, you're stable. And that really helps the learning professional buyer to sell that to the other stakeholders that you may never meet. And then the last quote they give us is, be committed to doing what it takes. We've done, and Roberta's done a lot of analysis where what we look for is the brand promise chain is what we call it. And that is from the first interaction that a buyer has with a provider, all the way through the signing the contract, looking at the SLA and getting started. And what we found is the breakpoints are post sales, you know, where the value drop. It's kind of like when you get onboarded at a company, you're a rock star when you're first being recruited. And then how many of you have joined an organization? You feel pretty much like you're on your own after you join. You know, it's like, what happened? Like I was a rock star when I was being recruited. Now I'm thrown into the deep end of the pool. Buyers oftentimes have the same reaction. They feel like the pinnacle of when they were getting connected with you was in the sales process. But then the, every other step in the buying process, are you keeping that promise? Are you sticking with what you originally said? And a lot of buyers give us anonymous candid feedback when we interview them and basically say, no, you know, I felt like I was right there in the sales part, but when I started dealing with the contracts or I started dealing with the fine print of add-ons or adding this or doing that or looking at the service level agreements or how is my, you know, what's the contact turnover as my point of contact. When I started getting more details beyond what the sales team was telling me, I don't feel that they've been committed to the same level. And that continues. You know, we have a lot of providers say, well, the reason why it didn't go right was because the implementation was kind of wonky. When we've delved into that, they're already underpinning problems well before the implementation hit. That was like the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. So being a great partner is saying, I'm committing this to you in the first five minutes of talking to you. And that brand promise, that level of commitment is actually going to continue to grow through the process, not diminish. Okay, let's go to use cases. I do have a little thing to add here. Like I think yeah, sure. that, Jump in. that 
that um, being committed to what it takes, this makes me think of like marketing and marketing messaging and setting expectations. And when there's an inconsistency in what you're promising to come up customers up front through the customer experience, and then they don't continue to get that same experience in real life, there's there's always there's also a mismatch. So there's a potential there to like look at, you know, how you how are you communicating? You know, if you're if you're a commoditized offering and you take that over to the customer side, then there's you know, that's not gonna surprise anybody. But if you're promising to have like enterprise level service and, you know, customization and all that, and then it just sort of drops off and tapers off and expectations aren't met, then there's there's a lack of consistency in in your messaging as well. I just wanted to add that from the market. Uh, it's it's spot on, Roberta. So let's jump on the super sharp use cases. So one of the things again, this is all direct feedback from buyers. They describe be focused on the problem, not a problem. And what they're trying to get at is this is where they feel like demos are very generic. Like you're trying to cover all these different things that you do, all these different problems that you've solved. What buyers feel a lot of times lost in the process is, you know, when is my problem getting addressed? When is the problem going to be talked about? You know, when are you going to? So we do a lot of setups for demos and taking organizations through selections. We are very revealing with our clients. We tell our clients, don't hold anything back from these providers. If you're in that final selection stage, send them a full dossier on who you are. Be transparent. Answer all their questions. Don't hide behind an RFP because the more you give providers a chance to get ready to demo with you, the better you're going to know if they're the right choice. If you play like I'm going to hold all the cards and not tell them much, you're going to get a very generic explanation of what they can do for you because you didn't allow them to get into your head and understand. So putting that aside, what can we do with buyers that are kind of playing things close to the best is right up front understanding what is their number one problem. Because what we recommend to, to clients is you don't choose a provider based on a thousand line Excel spreadsheet. What you have to do is you have to take that and we find consistently that providers are chosen by less than 5% of the requirements that are put forward. Because when we work with them, we get them to understand if these are five things that you can't live without, if these are the things, the things that you need and you can't live without these things and if a provider can't do them or do them to your satisfaction, why do you care about the other 900 things that are listed on on the spreadsheet, you're never going to work with them. You, you would literally be making a huge mistake to say they can't do the things I really need, but they can do all these other things that I kind of need. Makes no sense. So be courageous and lead with, you only have to solve one or two major problems in your organization to be chosen. So the recurring theme here is you can see like there's nothing wrong with being hyper-focused and going for it. The other thing that we get feedback on is this 360 degree understanding of the challenge. You know, a lot of times we get feedback from buyers saying, I feel like they're just focusing on one stakeholder within my organization. For example, you know, this sounds really good, but it sounds like it's only helping me as the L&D professional. How is this going to help the manager of that learner? How is it going to help the learner themselves? How is this going to help other business stakeholders? Give me the 360 degree understanding of, of the challenge. How is your solution going to make sure that all of my stakeholders, everyone that's involved in this learning process is going to be satisfied by your use case. The other is, is people say, can they, can they contextualize their solution? In other words, they don't want like five or six companies run past them and be told that they're just like them. There's no particular, even if you have two pharmaceutical companies side by side, they're not going to be the same company for you as a buyer. Everybody thinks they're different. You got to give them that. Buyers say like, you know, we know that they're going to bring up five other pharma companies and we're a pharma company, but we're different. You know, we're not just a pharma company. We're who we are. 
And we need to know that they can contextualize and see the subtle differences in our pharma company that's going to lead to a different outcome than four others. And they don't feel like they get that. And then the last is sharing stories, not sharing case studies. What they want to do is they want to hear a buyer journey. This is what we work on a lot What Roberta's team does a buyer journey mapping is to be able to say, let me tell you a story. Let me take you on the journey of another organization that isn't exactly like you. And I don't pretend that you are like you, but similar. And let me talk you through how we did what we did. And then let's talk about how things could be for you. So leading with case studies and just saying, wham, this is the way you are, is almost like profiling your buyer rather than taking them through a journey. And then the other thing we want to get into are the differentiators. And we've already kind of hit on this as a highlight, but drilling down, these are the things that buyers tell us what they want to hear come out of the mouth of a provider. You do this all the time, you know, all the time. This isn't something where it's a land grab where you're trying to like extend and say it can be all things to all people. They want to know that this is what you do all the time. They want to know all your expertise, all of your experience, all your know-how is being channeled into, we do this all the time, to the exclusion of not doing other things. And so this is what's so important. So again, you can see the recurring theme here is being hyper-specific is not going to lose you buyers. It's going to gain you buyers. And then it's what you focus on. And what they mean is, is that, Today, tomorrow, a year from now, 10 years from now, this is what you want to do. They want to know that you're not going to be taken off course. So if you like to do developer compliance training to highly regulated markets, then that's what your focus is going to be on. They're going to expect that if that is it, you're going to continue to refine that and be better. The third one, I think, is one that we, we have a complete miss on with buyers is they want to feel the love and, and passion and commitment your team has for what you do. You know, nothing, as you know, is more exciting than someone getting excited about what they do. It's infectious. We talk about it all the time. A person loves what they do. You know, it draws us into that conversation. It's engaging. Your buyers want the same thing. They want people to get on and like, you know, I can't wait to go through this with you. Getting people in front to say, this is what you love, this is what hits you where you live, is the key. And then the last thing about differentiators is providers, a lot of times the buyers get caught between what's different, but what is the differentiator? And this isn't a semantics class for English lit. There is a huge difference in the minds of the buyer. Buyers oftentimes mm -hmm. be told, yeah, I heard a lot of things that make them different, but I didn't hear what their differentiator was. So what they mean is, if you're doing compliance training for me in this pharma company, what is your secret sauce? Like what is your key differentiator in compliance training that makes me want to pick you? You can bring up a lot of reasons why you're different than your competition, but they don't care about that. They want to know if I give it to you, how is it going to be better with you than anybody else? What is that secret sauce? The differentiator, not a bunch of differences. And then finally, what we want to hit on is the last piece of this, which is product. What do, we, what do buyers mean by complete product? So they give us feedback like, you ask what's important for today and tomorrow. So in other words, what we're getting at here is, are you driving completeness based on what people need for today and need for tomorrow? I can't tell you how many providers we look at in a briefing and buyers feel the same way that providers, learning providers will oftentimes feel like they don't want to share their roadmap. They don't want to talk about tomorrow. They're afraid of commitment or they're afraid of like, they're going to nail our feet down or we're going to get into a conversation about tomorrow and they're going to take their eye off of today and I'm not going to get the deal. I'm here to tell you, you're going to have to just drop that idea. They want to know as a complete product that you're asking them what's important for today and tomorrow and that you're willing to go out on the limb, be courageous, 
say what it is that you're going to do. Listen, if a buyer takes a look at what you're doing today and they don't agree with tomorrow, then they're probably not the buyer for you. They're more of a suspect than a prospect. So be forceful and say, I'm willing to make a transfer. And I tell a lot of providers, put your entire roadmap on your website. What's the worst that could happen? People will look at it and say, you know what? They're a forward thinking group. I can see what they're going to be doing a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. How many people on, on this call have seen that Honda commercial where they kind of take the history of Honda and they finish with an airplane in the sky flying around? They put that it's an image, a CGI, but it shows where you're going. The other is, is they want to know that you're relentlessly creating and building. What they don't want to know is that the vast majority of your investment and you as a company is in your marketing campaign. One of the biggest pieces of feedback that we get from buyers is, you know, they seem to be very opaque about what their investment is in R&D. What are they building? What are they creating? Everything seems to be a little bit, you know, kind of arm's length. Don't want to get into it too much. And we, and oftentimes we send stories like, you know, it's under NDA or we can't really tell you right now. I mean, you're turning people off when you do that. You've got to be willing that if you want them to be a buyer, you're asking them to join your family and they're asking you to join their family. There's going to have to be a trust fall. So you're going to have to be revealing about we are creating, we are building. This is our reinvestment rate. This is what we're planning on. Bring them into your inner circle. The other is they want to know that you're never standing still. One of the biggest pieces of feedback we get from buyers is we've outgrown them. You know, we're into this agreement six months or a year, and they're already, we're outgrowing. Whose fault is that? It's kind of a little bit of both, right? It's some of the buyer that maybe they weren't forward looking enough and sharing with you where they're going. But as a provider, you don't want to ever send the message that you're standing still and not showing them where you're going with your product will not make them stand still. Hey, listen, if you don't want to do work with, with Gen AI right now, give them a reason why. You know, you give them a reason why. Or if you are, give them a really good reason why. Just show that you're constantly moving, you're constantly thinking, you're getting feedback. And they also want to know, as a client community, that when they join, that they have the ability to provide feedback to you. And then finally, we already hit it, is they don't want to know that marketing is your biggest investment. So I know we've got a couple minutes before we, we, we close out. I don't see any more questions. Have you any final thoughts before we sign off? Oh, you're on mute. No, I, I, I don't have anything to add, but if the audience has any questions, then I don't think we got the chat enabled, but the Q&A is still open. So if there's anything, otherwise um, we're really happy to meet one-to-one. -one. Um, Michael and I can meet anybody that's been on this call if you'd like some time. Oh, we've got some questions in. Becky, we'll meet you then. Um, Kyle, do you know percentage of folks that are planning on investing in tools for, is it 2024 or 25? It, it's actually, we actually answer that in a different way. It's a great question. The churn, we know actively based on the churn rate that about 35 to 40% of organizations will be in the mix looking for new learning providers in the next 12 months. The churn rate is exactly the look rate. Now, if you consider the churn rate being the equivalent to the divorce rate between provider and organization, the unhappiness rate you can only imagine is even bigger behind the scenes. So you got a lot of people out there that aren't happy as Roberta kicked off people were very self-revealing and I said that they gave less than five out of 10 as a score on their current providers. So there's a lot of churn. So I would plan on at least, at least that 30 to 40% churn, Never mind the unhappiness rate. Great question. Anyone, anyone else have any questions before we sign off for today? And Becky, thanks for your, your comment. That's great. We'll follow up with you, but we're, we're really hoping to wrap up that this was a bit of an eye opener, a fresh approach. 
we wanted to take you behind the scenes and share with you what we're learning. Hopefully you find this helpful and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.